you. Thanks, B. Thanks for the invitation. It won't be quite the same as five years ago. I've changed it a little bit. I did this. I really enjoyed it. The one five years ago was smashing. I really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed today's so far. I think there's some common themes as well, certainly from what Paula and John were talking about. Um, and thanks for staying. It's suicide. It's the end of the day. It's a long day. So <laughs> <laughs> not many jokes. That's, yeah, so. what, I, what I'm going to try and talk about is, is, um, is, is suicide prevention, really. Talk about suicidology and some of the difficulties it has with what some of the difficulties mainstream suicidology has with LGB and T suicide um, and some of the responses to that in terms of um, some guidelines for practice in terms of suicide prevention produced by people like the Royal College of Nursing and, and, and again try and just take a critical perspective on that and I want to finish up by, by um, talking about a paper that's had a, a, a really big impact on me, um, Vicky Reynolds' um, paper about hate kills, I talk about that. It's looking at suicide prevention from a social justice perspective, and it's changed my thinking quite a lot. And there are people in the audience who know about it, because I push it on everyone. <laughs> Anyone who shows even the slightest interest, they get a copy. So, <laughs> so uh, be your people who have all got copies. Um, I, I, this, this is my research journey, really. Um, I started off in community mental health. That's Faversham, it's a small town in Kent. I used to work there. And I worked there for about 10 years in a community mental health team. Um, and and s working with people that were suicidal a, a lot of the time. And what, what got me thinking, or, or, or what made me uncomfortable, was just how narrow uh, we as a mental health team approached the problem of suicide. And, and to reduce it that, that down to a simple way of understanding it, it was just very medicalized. We tended to, to, to see people that were suicidal and suffering from some form of mental illness um, that needed treatment for the mental illness to help with the suicidal thoughts. Um, and, I, and I found that difficult. I couldn't quite work out what was medical about suicide. It, it didn't sit easily with me. So, so I, I did a PhD and then wrote that up. And um, I, I found a bit of Foucault helpful to understand the history of suicide and, and how it had come to be medicalized. Um, and since that was published, what, what's been good is, is put me in touch with other people that are, are also taking critical perspective around suicidology. Now, this, this looks like we've taken cities, but it's not. They're just single people. <laughs> it looks like we're taking over the world. And it, and it makes, <laughs> makes it think, oh, yeah, this is really working. But it's only a few people. But they're really interesting people. Vicky's one of them is a social justice kind of worker. Um, but, but it's also, uh, this is a book we're publishing later this year around critical suicidology. But it's got first person accounts in that. It's got people that survive suicide attempts. It's got accounts of people that have been bereaved by suicide. It's also got accounts of people, indigenous people and people working in indigenous communities. Um, narrative therapists, there's some queer theorists. Uh, Rob Cover from Australia has written a chapter. And, and anthropologists, <coughs> and what they give is, I, I think, is just different perspectives on suicide prevention that, that isn't that kind of highly individualised, medicalised kind of version, um, which I argue kind of dominates suicide prevention. And what I'm interested in is how then, and again, this is similar to what Paula was saying and, and John was talking about, how those critical perspectives feed back into practice. I've been doing some work in a prison locally, uh, and as I sit on the Kenton Medway Suicide Prevention Board with these different organisations up there, and I'm just interested in how you can have conversations, how you can have those conversations where you can be critical and try and change practice. <coughs> and I actually find it really hard. And, and I don't think I've been that successful, actually. So it'll be interesting to get, at the end, people's perspectives on how, how you actually go about changing changing people's practice and, and, and assumptions. What I'm interested in, <coughs> methodologically really, well, there's the practice side, that, that kind of staff training and, and practical stuff. But I'm also interested in knowledge, and knowledge is about suicide, of and about suicide, and how that knowledge circulates. But I'm also interested in the nature of that knowledge and where it comes from, but particularly what it does. Um, so what is suicidology? Su suicidology is, is a kind of a discipline. It's, it's, it's academic and practical. And, and it's usually defined as the science of suicide and suicide prevention. Um, it's, it's in, in its modern form, suicidology, you can kind of trace to the 50s in the States, Edwin Schneidman and Robert Lippmann um, in Los Angeles um, d developed this kind of uh, disciplinary approach to suicide prevention. And it's kind of self-consciously a suicide, a self -conscious, a scientific venture. It's very positivist that it's kind of research methods and, and some of the assumptions. And I think it's dominated, well, it is dominated by, I, I think, psychiatry and, and psychology. Um, 
most of the leading figures within the, within the field are, are kind of from academic um, psychiatry departments in big universities or psychology. Um, and I think the effect of that is, is that it kind of, how suicide is thought about and how it's framed um, often comes from that kind of disciplinary thought, that disciplinary style of thought. So you get a, a, a kind of predominance of understanding suicide, reading suicide, writing about suicide, designing practices that are based around individual pathology. And, and, and the kind of research funds go into that in, in, in a big way as well. And I think there are shared kind of commitments, ontological, epistemological commitments that I'll unpack in a minute. And there's also issues around, I think, power and authority with those kind of institutional um, kind of approaches to the, the kind of foregrounds individual pathology above you know, other, other issues in suicide, I think. So these are the, th the assumptions I think kind of dominate suicidology. Um, I, I, I think the main one that guides the whole field is that su suicide is in some way pathological. So people who kill themselves are mentally ill. As I said, I think it's also... Um, Methodologically, there, there, there tends to be a, a very positivist kind of slant to the, um, to the research that's done. And also there's an assumption that suicide is best understood just in individual terms. So just to give some examples, if you read anything in the main kind of suicide, suicide prevention, suicidology literature, this gets repeated ad nauseum over and over again, this idea that, the, that, that they know the people that kill themselves are mentally ill. So you get states like this. In all major investigations to date, 90 to 95 percent of people who committed suicide are diagnosed with psychiatric illness, or 95 percent, or 98 percent, uh, 90, 95 percent. Um, and 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 this is kind of interesting for lots of reasons. I think one because it's, as I say, it kind of holds the field together as an assumption. Um, and it's also the lack of kind of critical engagement is interesting with this. This is just repeated as fact, but it's problematic for lots of reasons. I think. Um, one is that it's diagnosis by proxy, that they're, they're diagnosing people who have been mentally ill retrospectively. When they, these numbers all come out of what they call psychological autopsy studies. And so when someone's killed themselves, uh, researchers, when, when they kind of look what they see as trying to find the causes of, of the person killing themselves, and they tend to be psychiatrists, and they tend to frame their questions in a psychiatric kind of way. So they ask relatives and friends of the person who's died um, about what was going on for them. But they're kind of psychiatric checklists and it's by proxy, they're not asking the actual person. And the definitions of, of what constitutes mental illness I think are very broad, so they catch a lot of people. But what this does, it, it kind of reinforces the idea that, that suicide is primarily a psychiatric issue, a psychiatric problem. Um, in terms of the, 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 the research that gets done, this is a quote from one of the main suicide Suicidology Journals is Suicide and Life-Threatening Behaviour. That's the journal of the American Association of Suicidology. And this is an editorial written in um, 2011 by Tom Joyner. And he wrote, only by means of hypothesis testing with fair results using valid and quantifiable metrics with the field of suicidology advance. Thus the accurate translation of complex phenomena into numbers, numbers then amenable for inferential statistical analysis, or at the very least descriptive statistical analysis is taken to be the most desirable approach to studying suicide. And he comes up with this familiar hierarchy of kind of evidence to ex for the experimental design is advantage over the quasi experimental. And the bottom is the qualitative. And um, when, when you look at what gets published, Heidi Helmland, the Norwegian researcher, but she actually went through all the, um, the three main um, suicidology journals. And actually less than 3% of the studies published in the, the two, three years she looked at had any qualitative research. So, so it's numbers all, 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 all the way. Um, and even those 3% um, were qualitative add-ons to quantitative studies. So the field is, is kind of dominated with a certain way of, of, of researching. And again, this idea, again, it's quite Western idea that, that, that suicide arises from you know, as an individual, is, is, is best thought about, or can really most productively be thought about, just in individual terms. And Michael Krauss, an anthropologist, um, uh, wrote quite a while ago now, but th this belief in an individual-centred style of explanation holds us powerfully within its frame. And when I talk about Vicky's paper later, you can see you know, her critique of that is, is very powerful, I think. So when you turn in terms of practice, if, 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 you, if you are suicidal and, and, and you tell, start to tell people you're feeling suicidal, it won't be very long before you see a doctor um, and probably a psychiatrist, because that's how kind of our suicide prevention strategies are, 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 are kind of diagrammed, if you like. Um, 
what you have is this kind of repetitive discourse around kind of pathology illness. The practice is a kind of risk assessment, diagnosis, treatment, and final observation. The research is kind of very medical science dominated. And it's psychiatric clinics and wards that, that, that kind of seen as the main <coughs> suicide prevention um, kind of resources, really, what, what, what we tend to do. Um, and and I, I, I think that's problematic, as I'll explain in a bit. Um, this is a quote from um, Sean Fitzpatrick, which, which I like, actually. And, and, and he kind of critiques uh, the kind of mainstream suicidology. Um, and I think he's kind of raises lots of points in this quote. Um, but the, the challenges aren't only methodological, they are methodological because it's so limited that the methodology is kind of pub seen as publishable. Um, but it's also ontological and political as well. They concern questions about the kind of realities suicidology wishes to acknowledge in its practice and the way it represents and responds to suicide. As a social practice constructed by and constituted by persons, suicidology does not stand outside the moral reign, realm. It makes claims about the nature of suicide and the best ways of responding to it. Suicidology embodies and legit legitimates a moral response to it. These knowledge claims, the criteria by which they are evaluated and the practices which they support should be an important focus of sociological, philosophical and political inquiry. I absolutely agree with that. The difficulty is, is, is be being heard, is, is the critiques of suicidology. And I think in the original abstract I wrote about it being a fairly unreflective field, it's, it's a field that doesn't really have to listen to criticism. It gets huge amounts of funding. There's a lot of academic power. It kind of, um, I call it a regime of truth, but based on a kind of an uh, ontology of, compulsory ontology of pathology. It, it, it kind of reinforces itself to a degree that it's quite deaf to, 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 to kind of outside influences, really. Um, so there is good kind of anthropological work, there's good social justice work, there's good stuff coming out of indigenous communities um, that suffer for, for, from problems around suicide. Um, but actually the mainstream seems really quite immune to, to do any sort of challenge, which frustrates me a lot, actually. I, I, I find it very difficult. In a similar way to what Paula and, and her job were saying, um, so a, a, again, you know, you, you can write, you can make good arguments, you, you, you can come up with imaginative stuff that would have a lot of use, but it's actually really frustrating because the film doesn't seem to change much. In terms of problematizing, I, I, I think the most obvious one is that suicide and, and you know, this kind of mainstream, what the mainstream produces in terms of knowledge around suicide, is that suicide and self-harm are understood as a private individual distress, which is divorced from issues of social justice, exclusion and discrimination, stigma and power. That's from Simone Fulliger work in Australia. Uh, and this is what I wrote, but we, we have come to think about suicide almost solely in terms of individual mental illness and risk, and as a consequence, an individualised, internalised, pathologised, depoliticised, and ultimately tragic form of suicide has come to be produced with alternative interpretations of acts of self-accomplished, a bit worthy actually, self-accomplished, <laughs> marginalised or foreclosed. But it's, it's that depoliticising and individualising of suicide that I, I, I find difficult really, and, and other people do as well. So if, if, you, if you, I talk about in what ways LGBT suicide is, 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 a, is a problem in a minute, but one of the obvious issues is, is it's already problematic, I, I, I think, suicidology, but it becomes more problematic, I, I, I think, um, maybe when it tries to um, respond, understand and respond to LGBT suicide. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the, 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 the obvious the obvious one, that the, the context of the, the fact that psychiatry for a long time pathologised uh, homosexuality as a, as a form of illness, mental illness. And, and this stuff, which I came across when I, when I did Queer Paragon um, five years ago, it's, it's, it's just staggering, really. But, but this, was considered, this, is, this was the clinical psychiatry textbook that, that was used in training um, in the 50s and 60s. And, and all this. But, um, it, this is a way of categorising homosexuals as, as, as a type of person, as a type of human, a type of patient, I guess. Um, and it's horrible stuff. <laughs> it's really quite violent, isn't it? Um, and, and, and I think because of history and, and, and the treatments that, that were around for homosexuality, uh, obviously makes psychiatry and, and, and mental health services um, a, a kind of difficult proposition, I think, um, um, in terms of LGB and T. Um, one of the best quotes in terms of the, the kind of effects um, that's kind of psychiatric discourse around homosexuality had, uh, David Halperin's kind of quote I think is very powerful. To be and to find oneself known and described rationally or so it can be made to seem 
and therefore definitively, more objectively or so one is told than one is capable of describing oneself, and therefore irrefutably, resistlessly and with an instantaneous finality that preempts and defeats any attempt of one's own part to intervene in the process by which one becomes an object of knowledge and that renders one helpless to starve off the effects of a knowledge one has had no share in creating. That is an experience whose peculiar terror is hard to convey to those who have never suffered from the social liabilities that cause the rest of us to be continually and endlessly prey to it. So that kind of idea of you can be subjected to, to discourse as, as well as a subject or that. Um, and because of that, because of that history um, of psychiatry and homosexuality, I, I, I think, as, as the top quote says, you know, even though it was removed from DSM in 73, LGBT people continue to encounter this pathology model in mental health services, and LGBT youth continue to be psychopathologized through the association of sexual and gender non-normativity with the risk of mental illness. So there's plenty of evidence around, I think, that mental health services still can be quite homophobic and uh, unhelpful. And as Catherine Johnson says, the socio-medical construction of homosexuality that led to the pathologization of same-sex activities and the classification of homosexuality as a mental illness has left a legacy that's difficult to shake off. So I think suicide prevention around LGBT communities is difficult anyway because of the assumptions it works under. I think it's difficult because of that history. Um, and uh, combined together, I, I, I think it's, it's kind of has left um, something quite un unresolved, really. Um, because of how individualised and, and kind of just seen as a, you know, that psychiatric style of thought is the way to think suicide, I think it becomes <coughs> difficult for clinicians and experts around suicide to actually think contextually, to think of historical, social, political context. And, and so because they don't think in terms of context, they think in terms of interior kind of pathology, or the brain or, or whatever, um, then that's the way I think that LGBT suicide in, in a way challenges the field because you can't just understand it in terms of illness and, and pathology. You have to kind of contextualise. So I think it forces the field to think in terms of, of context, which it hasn't always been able to do, but it has been making attempts recently. Um, and, and there has been funding for groups um, uh, from LGBT communities to, 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 to kind of look at um, suicide as well. This is the rare um, research project, which is the risk and resilience explored, and, and, and um, um, that, that's looked at, um, and that, that continues to look at get kind of LGBT experiences around mental health. Um, and one of the good uses of kind of positive methodologies is, is, is you can get some comparisons between different groups in, in, in terms of suicide and, and, and suicide risk. And again, the, the, and this is fairly recent, um, and I know Professor Michael King at, um, in London did some research that did a, a, lit, a big literary, literary review as part of the National Suicide Prevention Strategy for England to look at LGBT suicide risk and didn't find much. So that there has been money around more recently to kind of quantify um, the, 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 the kind of issue. And what they've found is, is that there's a, there's a much increased risk. Um, the, the figures are, are fairly shocking, really. 34% of young LGBT people have made at least one suicide attempt in their lives, compared to 18%. But even that 18% is very shocking. 18% of young people feel they made a suicide attempt. And, and, and for the trans, um, trans young people, 48%, which is truly shocking. But even, you know, 26% of cisgender as well, but 48% are pretty shocking. Um, I hope you can see that, but the, the, again, again, this is kind of quantifying the, the, the different risks. The hetero is the smaller bars and the LGB. So at least one suicide attempt is maybe 34%. Suicide attempt in the last year, 10%. Um, suicide thought at least once, maybe 70%. <coughs> suicide thought the previous year, 35%. Uh, and this is for trans, cis versus trans. Um, so nearly 48% attempted suicide, 30% nearly in, in, in the previous year, 80, nearly 80, yeah, 89% thought at least once, and suicide thought in the previous year nearly 60%. So that's fairly shocking, and that's good research to, to kind of find that out, I think. And, and the, and the, the um, um, rare research project for um, some case, you know, kind of does contextualise that, that, that these things aren't just illness, it's not just individual pathology. But there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of context to, to, to these kind of experiences. Um, and, and they were, people were talking about coming out homophobic and transphobic bullying, struggles about being LGBT or trans within family at school and peer groups. So that kind of, kind of social response is very important. 
um, and to talk about things that, that, that are helping we're, we're very much in terms of kind of a tolerant, you know, kind of, kind of an understanding response for, from others um, uh, which in a way is, 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 is not a surprise now this has been taken up this is a little bit talking about that earlier um, the Royal College of Nursing has produced fairly recently, this is earlier this year some guidance, uh, preventing suicide among lesbian, gay, and bisexual um, young people. And uh, it's interesting, you know, I, most of the stuff I do is kind of discourse analysis, and it's interesting to read these things, and on the surface, it's very good, you know, it's, they're saying all the right things. Um, but I was also reading it thinking, no one's going to read this, and it's not going to change, you know, it's, not, it's just not strong, it's, it's just kind of, it's the right kind of advice, but there's stuff in there about motivational interviewing, and I'm thinking, no one's going to read that, that's not going to change their practice. Uh, it's some stuff about sort of right language to use, and you can imagine people rolling their eyes. But it may, maybe I've been a bit too cynical. You know, it, this should definitely be encouraged. But in terms of what will make an impact or what might, might change practice, I'm not sure. And that kind of the, the, the individual, um, a kind of mental health aspect comes in as well. It still gets read. That if someone presents for, for feeling suicidal, that, that, that's the kind of indication of mental illness. So that, that kind of pathology discourse, it, it still weaves its way through, through these documents. Yeah. And I also had trouble with this, really. Although it can be hard for nurses to play a role in uh, preventing discrimination and stigma happening, you can play an important role in mitigating its effects. I think that's highly <laughs> problematic as a statement. Why can't nurses you know, to do something to fight discrimination? Why, why are they there? Just to mitigate effects. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And there's one for, for trans as, as, as well. And again, there's a, there's a mental health, mental illness kind of discourse that throws its way through. The various studies in that, uh, highlight the high rates of depression and self harm among trans young people and adults in the UK. Uh, sorry, in the UK, more than one in three trans young people experience major depression. Now, it's, uh, it's complicated that that whole discourse, that way of framing experience around illness, mental illness, and depression, it can be helpful, it can be useful for people, you can get treatment. I, I'm, I'm more skeptical, um, but maybe not as skeptical as I used to be. It seems to become more mainstream and more, you know, kind of seems useful to, 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 to draw on that kind of way of thinking. Um, and again, th 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 this kind of um, the, the kind of talk that's in the, in, in the paper is, is it does also contextualise and it does talk about stigma and, and, and negative attitudes. But it also is like again the other discourse that runs straight through any suicide stuff is risk factor stuff. And again, it can be read between what what kind of contextualises and, and what kind of individualises. What I think is maybe a more interesting approach. This is Vicky Reynolds. Um, stuff and, and um, th th this is the kind of paper that changed my thinking around suicide prevention really. Um, she's a Canadian social justice um, activist which is also a narrative therapist uh, and she gave a talk she stood up at the Canadian Association of Suicide Prevention in 2011 I think it was and, and gave a talk. She's not a suicide prevention person per se but she wor works with people um, that are suicidal, she works with people who've been bereaved by suicide, and, and sh she works with um, therapists who have had clients uh, in their lives. And she covers a lot of ground in the talk. She got a standing ovation at the end. She's, she's just fantastic. It's, it's fantastically powerful. I, I'll only read, read bits of, of what she said, but the, the kind of themes that she's drawing out, I think, are the I important ones, really. And, and so she talks about, I'll talk a little bit about resisting individualism and the social, but well, I have been talking about that, but I'll talk a little bit more. I think this idea around critically engaging with the languaging of suicide is, is interesting. I'll talk a bit about that. I'll skip this. If anyone's interested in a paper, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's going to be in our critical suicidology book um, coming out towards the end of the year, um, but I'm happy to send the, the paper. I'll talk about the little bit around contesting simplistic constructions of bullying, and then, then I'll, I'll, I'll give you some conclusions. Um, but anyway, what Vicky kind of stood up and said was that her perspective comes from a social justice activist orientation that aims to respond to suicide from a broader context than psychology usually allows for. An anti-oppression and decolonizing ethical stance and a social justice response to death's language of suicide are the heart of this work. Engagement with social justice activism and therapeutic and community work have taught me that hate kills. Using the language of suicide masks the heart-wrenching suffering, daily indignities and desolation many people struggle with. The language of suicide quiets our collective discomfort and provides a cause for those stolen lives, normalises the social context of exclusion, stigma and hate in which these horrid deaths occur. 
In this writing, I aim to enact accountability for all the people I've lost to suicide, particularly gender and sexual diverse and questioning youth who did not kill themselves, but whose lives were stolen by hate. This is heartbreaking work. And I, I just respond to that, and, and I respond to the emotion of it, and, and, and the language of it, and the anger about it, and, and the calling out that hate kills. And, and, and th when I read all the other kind of suicide prevention stuff, that language of academic neutrality and evidence basis and risk factors doesn't get anywhere close to that. And that's what I'm thinking, listening to John and, and, and all this stuff, that actually part of it is, is the, the language we use and the strength we use it and the emotion we put into it, because to just... You know, and, and again, th these are well-meaning documents, but they're bland. And, and, and it is, it's to, to work with suicidal people, to lose people to suicide, is heartbreaking. And when you know people like that, and you know the context, and you know the stories, and you know there was, it's, it wasn't just individual mental illness, but there was a, it was a what Vicky points to is hate, th then you know, this, this begins to speak to me, I think, and, and I think to many others. In terms of resisting individualism and attending to the social context Vicky um, kind of spoken and has written, Suicide is not something that happens to one person. It is not something that one person does. Nobody simply kills themselves. Events occur in context, and because we live in a society that's not delivered on the promises of social justice, which we are well qualified and able to deliver, we have to structure into our analysis of a person's death the context of social injustice in which they lived. I resist efforts to locate issues of social injustice inside the minds of clients, and I challenge dominant understandings that explain suicides as expressions of mental illness. In terms of the languaging of, of, of what, what she draws on is uh, Alan Wade's um, um, work and Linda Coates. Um, um, when I talk about critical engagement with language in relation to abuses of power, I am particularly informed by the work of Canadian response-based therapists Linda Coates and Alan Wade. They have made unique theoretical contributions to understand the people's responses to attacks on their dignity and safety that have had important implications to work with people who have suffered violence. They outline four operations of language. Obscuring violence, hiding the victim's resistance to violence, obscuring the perpetrator's responsibility and blaming the victim. So what Vicky's and other people are looking for is, is to find a language that kind of makes visible the, 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 these kind of, um, um, uh, kind of actions of language and, and to come up with a, a, a different way of talking. In, in an abstract, it's, it, 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 it seems a bit abstract, but what, what made me think when I read this, or when I reread it recently, is a volunteer at the Samaritans, and, and the Samaritans have phones and they have email, but they also recently started a texting service so people could text. And um, it has just been inundated. They've had to take the number away because so many people have, have, have texted. Um, but, so I sit there and I, and I respond to texts from people. And the over and I'm not exaggerating, the overwhelming majority of the women have been sexually abused and who are either young women or older women and the sexual abuse is, is a constant theme and so is self-harm and suicidal thoughts and hearing voices and the language that they seem to have learned to understand their experiences is around having personality disorder that's good what they've been diagnosed as having and this immediately when I read this recently I thought that's it, that's it. it, it we, we developed a language for talking about distress that does all those things. It obscures the violence and, 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 and the abuse. It, it kind of hides the victim's resistance. They just become this person that needs services and needs kind of help because they, they, they have an illness. It, it obscures the perpetrator's responsibility. And, and you, every time I'm reading these texts, and, and I'm just thinking, there's the perpetrators of the abuse uh, 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 are, are fine, probably. <laughs> these women are suffering terribly. And how does that not become, how is that not more at the forefront of our thinking around self-harm and suicide? And, and again, what, what happens with that borderline personality kind of diagnosis is that it becomes, everything becomes how they're not dealing with or are dealing with their kind of illness, or their personality disorder. And I, and I find that problematic. So I'm, I'm very much with Vicky in terms of her looking to, to kind of contest that, really. And, and I think the language of mainstream suicide prevention kind of does, does those things. Um, I, d I just very quickly talk about the bullying thing because again I think she highlights a couple of interesting areas there then, then I just conclude um, and I think she's saying something similar again the language of bullying decontextualises and depoliticises hate and violence and obscures the patriarchy and homophobia that inform bullying the language of bullying in inverted commas individuates events and puts responsibility for a hateful society on particularly young boys and girls <coughs> 
And uh, what she says next, I think, is just really interesting. I believe that unjustly spoils the identity of youth who perpetrate bullying. These youths did not invent these ideas. I have worked with youth who have spoiled identities of bullies. They are other too. We can legitimately deny them education and belonging. We are placing the context of hate and the responsibility for injustice on the backs of our children and blaming them for these deaths. I'm not saying that people are not responsible for their behaviour, but a social justice frame requires us to always examine the social context to understand events. And I was saying to Annie just a minute ago, there's another paper that Bick has written, where she talks about working with perpetrators of, of sexual violence. And, and but she talks very much that y y there's not a binary between holding people accountable for their actions and, and working compassionately with them to help them change. And I think that's helped, I've been, say, been doing some work in prisons, and, and it's actually helped me frame that y you can do both those things, hold people accountable, but also work compassionately with them as, as best as you can. I'll just sum up with Vicky. Vicky's done lots of the work of this paper for me, as you might have noticed, which is, but she does it so well. Um, and again, I think this ties in with maybe lo lots of what people said, but again, thinking of Porter and, and, and John's. Yeah. I believe we have an obligation to contest neutrality. We are not neutral about hate. Um, we have the power to move things from private pain to public issue. Um, and this is, I think, what psychiatry and psychology and suicide, suicidology has a difficulty in, in, in kind of recognising as an issue, um, that how the public issues of injustice end up as just being read as private pain and to resist the privatisation of the pain of suicide. As change agents I, be I believe we need to belong people who have been told by hate that they do not belong on this earth and we need to participate in delivering justice to them and to all of us. Resisting hate, practising solidarity and transforming society to be inclusive and just is suicide prevention in its most radical form because social injustice, hate, stigma and oppression create the conditions that make the horrors of suicide possible. So that's what we're doing. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I think that's, uh, just going back to this one. So that's what kind of informing that, 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 that kind of thinking, I think. And I think it's very different from, from the kind of mainstream suicide. Energy. And I think how that gets put into practice is, is difficult and it's challenging. But I think I'm with Vicky Reynolds and say, we need to contest neutrality. We need to contest the, the, the kind of the bland, kind of just, and uh, this is how you talk to someone. Okay, this is how you talk to someone. This stress. I, th I think it requires a much different emotive kind of response. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did that make sense? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Should we take some questions? Yeah. yeah. To do that? Um, right at the back. I think you were first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to try to keep my comments on a tapering because I have. Um, a lot of them floating around in my head, so I won't dump them all out, but um, I, I think the, uh, first of all, thank you, I really appreciate this perspective, um, and uh, one of the things that, that I think is really important about the work that you're doing is that while many of our fields are often uh, sort of called to task on stuff like mm -hmm. this by the experiences of people who themselves have been the victims of injustice in the kind of way that that um, that suicidal clients and, and people who've completed suicide um, have been that you're that you're pointing to in a medicalized field. Anyone who has been through that has a diagnosis and automatically becomes a patient and someone who is not to be listened to because they're not fully rational or they're not fully sane. Yeah. So I think that the silencing of the experiences of people who may be called suicide survivors, but are in fact sur survivors of a medico-pharmaceutical system, um, is also a critical part of the problem that you're up yeah. against. Yeah. Um, the other piece, I, I, a friend of mine um, who works in the field of political science works with a concept of deservingness, that there are certain stories that socially we sort of consider, um, these are stories that are sad and lamentable, Judith Butler would say grievable, yeah. right? And, and so these are people who deserve services. So if we're, for instance, in support of more social services for people, we'll talk about grandmothers who, you know, who are in need. I think that there's, there's also uh, a very important question here about um, deserving this and, and sort of whose narratives are are coming out, so it's interesting and I think important that these studies are being done on youth. I think that youth, regardless of sexual and gender identity, are often constructed socially as deserving. 
but they're also given a little bit of a pass around suicide, like that's something that you sometimes do, and so they're not pathologized for the rest of their lives. So I also found myself wondering, what about adult um, suicidality? And that to me also then echoes, resonates very closely with some of the stuff you were talking about with texting. Sexual abuse, yes, also domestic violence. Both, and, and that's something that's part of my work as a public intellectual, which I don't get to do very often, but it's really important to me. Um, both of those are invisible in queer communities, both within the community, and certainly as far as medical providers go. And I've, I've written in another context that the insidious brilliance of emotional abuse is that the abuser gets the victim to inflict the physical harm on the abuser's behalf. And so when the victim shows up in the hospital with, with a suicide attempt or wounds that are clearly self-inflicted, then the person who is the problem is automatically constructed as being the victim, when in fact it's the abuser who is there standing in the corner being the worried partner or the worried yeah. spouse, who is then handed control of psychiatric medications and so on. So it's the further victimization that happens precisely at the hands of medical providers, I think is another really important axis here and, and something that, that would be picked up if there were work done on adults. But I understand that in order to convince the field to change, we actually need the youth because of that deservingness yeah. piece. So that's a million pieces, <laughs> but thank you very much for, for, no, that's for really all of us. That's really but true. Following on, on her comment, I mean, I will just say one thing on it. I mean, what happened was there's no one victim, but you have a society, right? I mean, just looking, uh, talking about tomorrow, the Caribbean, the Cayman Islands, people being driven to suicide because they have this wall that is basically pushing them to that. It's not just one person in a corner, right? Mm -hmm. It's the whole room collapsing on them. Uh, is that, is, would that change your discourse? Or, or yours? I mean, well, it's, it's interesting what, 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 like what you're saying, what becomes visible and, 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 and what doesn't. The, su the prison suicide stuff is absolutely shocking. It, it, it's ten times what it is in the general population. It's, it went up 67% in our prisons last year. The Guardian, one of the, probably the only left-leaning paper left, reported it, but, but it, it wasn't widely reported. The, the, the Department of Health did some, again, this is the useful side of statistics, but did some work after you know, the financial crash and found that there are an extra thousand suicides as, as a context in the two years that followed. That's a thousand lives. And, and they were people that weren't visible because they were almost always unemployed or in debt and lived in the middle of them. They lived in the northeastern places where there was deprivation. It's multi-layered as well because I work with young people and I, I run a group and they're taking our group away because the funding is not there. Yeah, yeah. So I can tell you now that the suicide rate is going to go up. Yeah, no, yeah. Because absolutely. there's not that community we're taking away that community because the funding's not there to run yeah, it absolutely yeah yeah and i think that's happening at, at, across the board uh, and, and the suicide. prisons are awful the, the, the prison suicide they haven't got they've got way too many prisoners and not enough staff and the suicide you know they've reduced the staff by about 20 percent in prisons 24 percent and the suicide rate's gone up like that and you you just it's just shocking the indifference that you know that that, that you, you you get within the prison service you know they're not grievable lives. You had a question? Thank you, yes. Uh, I wonder how you think <coughs> all this fits with the gender divide. Um, that is, that some four times the number of suicides which are successful, so to speak, are male as compared to female. Um, when, the, when this figure came out, uh, it, it's perfectly possible to look at it and say, well, what we've done as a society is to construct an impossible model of masculinity, yeah. which yeah. no one can actually fit with, a, impossible levels of competitiveness for, for sex, for, for occupations, and, 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 and so on, uh, and also levels of caring that, 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 that are expected of males. And this, this level of masculinity can't be sustained, and, and, it, and it's too much pressure for some people. So that, was, that would be a way of looking at that figure. That's why. Yeah. Actually, all the discourse when those figures came out were was Men don't talk enough about their emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's therefore their fault. And what we've got to do as a society is get them to talk more yeah. about, about, about how they feel about yeah. life. Yeah. So, so, so exactly what you were saying, 
blame the victim. It becomes something in the mind of one person that, that we need to encourage them, them to engage in treatment. <laughs> no, there's a, there's a fantastic um, report done by the Samaritans um, um, around men in society and, and suicide. But yeah, they talk about hegemonic masculinity, particularly in working class communities. But there's just one way to be male. And if you fall outside of that, there's also some interesting work in Australia, Catherine Jaworski's stuff around the gendering of suicide and how certain stories get read as suicide. And they tend to be quite male, those stories uh, about finality and lethality and stuff. And so it might be that there's discrepancies in the, in, in, in the rates. Um, to men and women be because of how suicide gets stored and how some female suicides maybe don't get read as suicides b b because of that gendering. Um, in prisons, it's just the rates are the same, female suicide rates, not numbers, but rates per thousand, whatever, the same as, 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 as men. Uh, yeah. Just um, one question about the uh, Bob Clear start when you started to speak about people killing themselves because. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering about the language. Um, really, kind of, you know, when you, when you came around and spoke about you the strength of language, I already got that. But at the start, it was you know, the last time I was at kind of a mental health suicide conference. In my other life, a youth worker, and had to, you never see that. You never, you know, talk about people killing themselves. It's about them dying by suicide, a much more passive thing. Yeah. And again, it's like, acceptable because they just they died by suicide. It's like they died by <laughs> I don't know what. But I mean, that point about is that a common language now in sociology? They killed themselves. That is uh, because that's problematic for us to look at. But that's something we need to engage yeah. with. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. When I wrote a book, I used self-accomplished death, but it didn't take off. It wasn't <laughs> <laughs> very catchy, is it? Um, but a lot of um, energy within suicide prevention, particularly people that have lost loved ones to suicide, is around the language. But and again, in a, in a very, um, it's a passive. I'm just trying to think. It's committed. It's, if you ever use the word committed at a suicide conference, you, you'll be marched <laughs> out the door because that is seen as the worst thing you yeah. could do because there's apparently some association with guilt and crime and you commit a crime. But for me, I'm with you, it, it, it's, it's a different languaging problem and that they, the final points are less important than the kind of, I think, almost like the emotion we bring to it. And, and the, it's like outrage. I, th I think Vicky is heartbroken and outraged at, at, at kind of what you see. And, and I feel that when I sit at the Samaritans. But I don't feel it in conferences. Suicide. We went to the American Association of Suicide, which is like the heart of darkness for, for me. <laughs> it's like to, just to try and argue, you know, to try and create a bit of provocation. And of course, the people that we wanted to argue with didn't turn up. But there were loads of people who did turn up that worked for organisations with youth and, and, and LGBT organisations. And, and, and they were really enthusiastic. They said, this is what we want to, this is the sort of conversation we've, we've been looking to have. But having done that for the last few years, and maybe I'm been, we're talking about optimism and pessimism. I do get down about the, 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 repetiti the, the repetition of those, a way of thinking, a way of talking, a way of acting, that just it seems to be immune to, just deaf to, to kind of. Do we have data to preceding the, like, was that the launch for the, the rare um, report? Do we have, I, I forgot to ask, do we have data preceding <coughs> that to see if things are getting better or worse? Because I know in Ireland, they're, they're redoing the, the supporting LGBT lives um, work now because it was our first staff in 2010, so they're redoing it. And is there you know, data at the start of that we can look at around LGBT people? Yeah, I, th I think when they did the uh, professor, well, I think his name's, I can't remember his first name, I think it's Professor Michael King, he's at the university, I think he might be at King's University in, in London, uh, did a, quite an extensive literature review, but he didn't find much, and so it was difficult. A again, you were saying earlier, you know, everything's quantifiable, but you actually find that, you know, Sexuality, whatever, isn't necessarily hasn't been counted, and it hasn't within the, the film. Again, in terms of you know what's real and, and what's visible, I don't think LGBT suicide has been until the, the last few years, and and it's encouraging to see you know if, if you quantify it and it find out that it, you know people are obviously you know, at higher risk to use the language they use. Um, that that's good to know, but if that's all you then do is go, oh, we, we haven't did this, and it's a bit like what you were saying, you know. You, you go into you know some nursing policy and stuff. They say, oh, this is, this is we need to be nice, and you say, no, it's not quite enough. You know, you, you haven't quite grasped the criticality of, 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 of kind of what needs to be done. But that's not to criticise it because I think it is better than it was. But sorry, it's another rambling answer. But in terms of, I don't think the figures are there, and I don't know if it's getting better or worse. But the suicide rates are going up in, in general, and, and, and I think for some of the reasons you've said that, you know, that there's lots of those wider supports have been. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.